Uh, Psalm 1720. God gave the command, sent forth his word and healed them. So they were saved, rescued from dying, destruction or their pits. And I always like to emphasize the fact that he started the process by sending forth a command. He gave his word. That's what came first. That's what started the whole concept, the whole process in every aspect of salvation, in every aspect of his deliverance. It starts with him giving a command. It starts with him sending forth his word. And it was through the word, through the command, that healing came forth, salvation came forth, rescue from dying, rescue from destruction, rescue from our pits. And it's not changed. It's still the same way. The word comes first. You want to get out of whatever pit you're in? Find the word on it. Start meditating the word on it. Start thinking about the word that God has already spoken, what God has already commanded about that particular situation to see a change. Next one, Mark 16, 20. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord, master, kept working right with them and confirming the message, proved that their preaching was true, validating the message with indisputable evidence by the attesting signs and miracles that were performed that closely accompanied it. So even after Jesus left, the disciples went out and continued to do what he did. Uh, Acts starts, it's funny, uh, same author Luke wrote Luke, Gospel Luke, and then also Acts. And it says, uh, O Theophilus, the former letter that was about what Jesus began to do and to teach. And now I'm writing a second letter. Well, what's what's the implication there he's not done doing what he began to do and what he began to teach because these other guys now are doing the same thing and teaching the same thing that he began to do and to teach and that's what this is talking about here how is jesus still on the earth through us how can he do greater works well at least part of it is there are a lot more of us than the word of him we can cover a lot more territory are we doing that or are we just existing in the territory? Are we expanding it? Are we increasing the kingdom saturation, if you want to call it that, of the territory? Or are we just biding our time? This is one of the ways that we could increase the effectiveness, increase the uh, extent, increase the authority, the realm, the, the territory of the kingdom. Acts 4, 29-31. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Now, what had just happened prior to this? They healed the guy at the gate beautiful. And the religious leaders called him to the carpet about, what are you doing? How did you, how did you do this? Uh, in what name did you, we forbid you to use that name anymore. And they came up with the conclusion, it's probably a better thing for us to serve God and to tick you off than for us to not to serve God and be content and be at peace with you. So right after that, they say, oh, Lord, you've heard of the threats. You've heard what they're going to do to us. You've You've seen what they are promising to do if we continue to, to preach like this, to talk like this, to see these things happen. And then they said, okay, we don't even care. Give us more boldness. And let that boldness be confirmed by you working signs, wonders, miracles, validating, confirming the message that was preached. And if somebody has a problem with it, then they have a problem with what you're doing, not necessarily what we're saying. Because they're one and the same. They're being supported. They're being... Uh, validated they're being confirmed and then the meeting place shook i always think this is funny acts four is just a little bit after acts two when the holy spirit was first poured out probably just a few days if you actually looked at the history and they already needed to be refilled they were saturated in the upper room so much so that it came pouring out the room and they already need to be real go to yeah i'm just really glad that you threw that in there and, uh, and um, it's just something that I've been praying about and trying to do uh, when it's a good time to bring this up. And I know that everyone in here is not only just like minded, but they also do the same thing as far as it's said. And some people are thinking that, like, the 
spirit of God is being poured out on the all place at this moment. But like what you had said, he had already poured his spirit out. The promise of the spirit had came in Acts chapter two. So we're not worried about when is you know God pouring out the spirit of the and it was supposed to be at that moment it was supposed to be or that was the initial act and it had to agree with the jewish feast and it, it had that there was a certain time uh, I, I like acts 2 where it starts and when the day of pentecost was fully come what was he waiting on all he was waiting on was that day to show up he wasn't waiting on them to pray a certain amount he wasn't waiting on them to get down to a certain number in the room all he was waiting on was that day to show up and from that day forward it's free reign and i don't want to say that loosely that but the Holy Spirit's here. He's ready. He, he wants to participate. He wants to get involved. He wants to fill us over and over and over and over again. And we need to be filled over and over and over again because, like I like to say, we leak. We got some holes that we've got to plug so that we would stop leaking. And even then, we're probably not going to completely stop leaking. The side benefit, then, of being refilled with the Holy Spirit was boldness. So I have to ask myself, am I bold? And if not, why? What do I need to go back and revisit to reacquire the boldness or to get it for the first time if I've never operated in that? What's missing? If I'm not bold, there's a reason. And here, this verse might contain an answer to that reason. All right, here's some key points that we've talked about through this study, and then we'll actually get into today's lesson. Everything that Jesus did and said is a direct revelation of the will of God for all people for all time. If you ever heard him say it, if you ever saw him do it, then that is God's will, not just for the person in the story, but for all people for all time. Otherwise, he's changed. He's different. Or he's showing favoritism. Both of those two things are not characteristics of Christ, are not characteristics of the anointed one or his anointed. So. If he ever said it, if he ever did it, then that's God's will for you today. That's God's will for whoever wants to take him up on it at whatever time they want to take him up on it. If you say what God said, then God will do what you say. Think about that for a second. Who started the process? God starts that process by saying, and he has committed to back up you saying what he said. So if you want God to do what you say, then it's very, very simple. Do, say what he said. And watch, see how fast he will do what he said when you say what he said. You get tongue twisted real quickly with that, but th the point is still true. If you say what God is already saying, what God has already said, then God will do what you're saying because he said it first. Third thing that we noted as kind of a memorable point, pride makes excuses, humility makes adjustments. So if I approach a situation and somebody says, well, it would be better if you did this or you're doing this wrong or whatever, I have a choice. How am I gonna to respond to that situation? And it doesn't even really matter if I'm really wrong or really right. The choice is still, how are you gonna respond? If they, whoever, whatever authority is, is correcting me about a report I write or about something that I'm doing or not doing, a family member that says, you need to be doing it this way. Okay, I've got to really evaluate that. I mean, I could easily respond to who do you think you are? How am I responding? That's pride making some sort of excuse. You don't have the right to tell me that. Never mind whether you're actually doing it or not. Never mind whether you're actually wrong or not. Or I can respond in humility and say, okay, I'm going to look at that. I'm going to consider that. Maybe I need to make an adjustment because obviously what I'm saying, what I'm doing is not coming across correctly. It's not coming across like it's being fair, or like it's well represented. There's something wrong with what I'm saying or doing that's even causing this conversation. So I need to just at least reevaluate, be willing to reevaluate and be willing if necessary to make an adjustment rather than default to an excuse. Faith will work in your heart with thoughts of doubt in your head. Faith is a force that's only contained in your heart. It's not a mental thing at all. 
Sometimes your mind is still in conflict with your spirit. Sometimes your mind still has questions. Sometimes your mind still has doubts. And we think, well, because I'm still doubting this, I'm not really in faith. Well, what we've got to realize is faith is operating in your heart. And it doesn't have anything to do with your head. The more you get your head in alignment with what God is doing, the easier it is for you to stay in faith. The easier it is for you to get past, okay, I've got this thought of doubt. I've got this thought of question. I've got these thoughts that, that aren't lining up with this yet. Give it time. But don't pull your faith off the situation. Don't pull your faith out of what you've already agreed on, what you've already declared, waiting on your thoughts to line up. The process is reversed. It's got to be established first in your heart, and then eventually it'll work your way into, its, into your head, or it may not, and it doesn't matter. And we've got to be okay with the fact that maybe it doesn't even matter because faith will work in my heart even when there, I've got doubts going around in my head. And then the last thing that we thought was interesting, um, never blame anyone or anything else for your inability to receive. Ouch. We go to a prayer line and, and nothing happens for us, but it is for all the people around us. Well, it's still their fault. They weren't in the flow. They weren't in the mojo. They didn't anoint me with enough oil, whatever the case may be. We want to blame somebody else for our inability to receive and say, okay, God, obviously there's still a problem here. Obviously, I haven't got this figured out. There's something in me. What is it? What is it in me that's preventing me from receiving what everybody else received in that same service? The problem is internal, not external. You, you, you know about these people that they go from job to job and job to job or class to class to class to class. And oh, I just had a problem with that teacher. And oh, no, I had a problem with this boss. They just didn't like me. And then the next place, well, I just didn't get along with that teacher. And I, that boss just didn't like me. Okay, after this happens three or four times, what is the common denominator? <laughs> You're the person that's involved in each of those situations. Maybe just for chance, the problem is with you and not with any of them. Anyway, our inability to receive from God is our problem. And he wants to help us with that. He wants to give us wisdom. He wants to give us understanding. He wants to have somebody speak to that and fix that. But we've got to be willing to make a change when they do and can't just excuse it away because, well, it's obviously their problem. No, you're the common denominator. You're the one that is not receiving when everybody else is. Why is that? Get it fixed. God wants to help. All right. In this series, we talked about 25 healings and faith was mentioned in one way form or another in 21 of them. So is faith a component to you receiving healing? Was it a component in scripture to people, even under the ministry of Jesus, where there's any detail given? Was faith a component? They either had to do or say something most of the time that identified, that made a confession about their faith. Something about faith had to be involved the majority of time. Uh, some of these were initiated by the person themselves. Some were initiated by a group. Uh, some was initiated by somebody else on behalf of somebody, and somebody just the Holy Spirit just decided to take over and do something. Uh, was faith mentioned uh, in 12 of them? Yes. And 13 of them? No. Was faith evidenced? Meaning they had to do something that proved that they were operating in faith or had faith. They they did something. They followed an instruction. They they took a step. They stood up. They They made some effort that they weren't able to do before that took, put them in the faith journey. 20 times, yes, five times, no. Is faith a factor? Is it a big factor? Absolutely it is. And it's one factor in this that you can control to a certain extent. So if you're having trouble, work on your faith. Get into his command, get into his word about whatever situation and build yourself up, build your faith up until you're able to receive that, to be able to walk in the promise. All right, lesson 27. Epaphroditus. Last week we did part one. This week we're going to do part two. We'll do just a slight review of the healing of Epaphroditus. It's found in Philippians 2, 25 through 30. Philippians 2, 25 through 30. We'll read that in just a minute. Let's review just a little bit about what we did last week. So what was Epaphroditus doing there with Paul 
in prison in Rome. What was he doing? How did he get there? We backed up into Philippians chapter two a little bit, and that didn't really answer the question as to why he was there. We'll, we'll deal with that in just a second. Uh, go ahead and, uh, why was he there? He was bringing the offering that the Philippian church was given to Paul, the care package. He was assigned by the church to bring the package, to bring the offering to Paul, to travel from Philippi to Rome to get this offering, care package, whatever, into Paul's hands. That's why he was there. We backed up into chapter two a little bit before this particular passage. Verse 14 of Philippians 2 tells us to do everything without grumbling or complaining. Ouch. Everything without grumbling or complaining. So under what circumstances is it right for us to grumble, complain, gripe? None. We don't like that. Somehow we think we've got a right to grumble, complain, whatever. It gets into uh, what you allow around you as well. You need to have a zero tolerance policy where strife is concerned. Strife, we talked about, is the manifest presence of the devil. So if you allow it, you are contributing to the devil being allowed to manifest himself in whatever situation that is. And yet we give strife kind of a free pass sometimes. We, we keep our mouths shut. We don't do what we need to do to make sure that it isn't present, that it isn't active. And really what we're doing is we're allowing the devil to manifest physically in whatever situation we're allowing that to continue. The only way, this, the passage goes on in Philippians, the only way that we shine as stars in a dark world is to act differently than the world does. Would it be different of us to not grumble, to not complain, to not gripe, and to have a zero, policy, zero tolerance policy for strife? Would that make us different from the world? We talked about shining of stars and how the stars are different brightnesses. If you look up in the sky, there's not two stars that have the same brightness. Now, I know physically part of that is how big the star is and how far it is from the earth. I understand that but they still shine different degrees. Can people shine different degrees in the midst of this dark world? And if they can, why? Perhaps some of them are more adept at this no griping, no complaining, no strife stuff than others. So it's, they're more obvious, it's more distinct that they're different from everybody else. You cannot be in faith about something and be griping about it at the same time. Faith calls those things that are not yet as though they already are. You can't do that and gripe or complain about the present state. Anyone can talk about how bad things are. It doesn't take any spiritual gift whatsoever. It doesn't take any spiritual inclination. It doesn't take any spiritual revelation. It doesn't take any spiritual anything for you to gripe and complain about how things are. Anybody can do that. You don't need any help doing that. But you become suddenly radically different when you refuse to gripe, complain about how things are presently and you continue to talk about how things are going to be, the end result that you desire. Remember that Epaphroditus was right there with Paul as he's writing this letter. So what can I assume from that? Would the letter have gone differently if Epaphroditus wasn't living these things that Paul was writing in the letter. I don't think the letter would have been the same. I think there would have been something else in the letter if Epaphroditus had been a knucklehead about some of this stuff and he's sitting there while Paul's writing this and he's probably going to have Epaphroditus take the letter back to Philippi. So if the messenger isn't doing what's in the letter, you'd think they would have had some sort of conversation about that, and the letter would have to contain. I even had to get on to Epaphroditus about him not doing this. Or we had to have a discussion before I allowed him to take this letter back with you. So the fact that he's sitting there, to me, says Epaphroditus was doing all these things. He wasn't griping. He wasn't complaining. He wasn't allowing strife. He was shining differently as stars in the midst of a dark and perverse 
generation. He was doing all this stuff that Paul's talking about. Just a second, we'll, we'll see even more evidence of that fact. All right, let's read the story of Epaphroditus. Philippians 2, 25 through 30. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Let's stop right there. He was distressed for what reason? The church that sent him heard that Epaphroditus was ill. That was the thing that got him bent out of shape. Not the fact that he was ill, but that he had heard that they're upset that they heard that he was ill. Yeah. Is he griping about his illness? Yeah. Is he griping about his sickness? Is he declaring how hard and how difficult and how, how challenging things are? Well, if you guys wouldn't have sent me down here, I wouldn't be sick like this. Is that the tone of somebody that's only concerned about the people that sent him knowing that he's okay when he got sick. Verse 26, for he longs for all of you and was distressed because he heard, you heard he was ill. 27, indeed he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I'm all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So what was bothering Paul? The fact that Philippi was upset because they didn't know the status of the guy, Epaphroditus, that they had sent to minister to Paul. Paul and Epaphroditus, neither one of them are concerned about themselves. They're both concerned about the church in Philippi. Do you see that? 29, so then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. We can't just start there and get the full story. We must back up a little bit and get a little context about who Epaphroditus is and what he was doing there in the first place, which we did. We did that last week. What was he doing there? He was delivering this offering that Philippi determined to send to Paul, the care package, if you will. Let's read verse 25 from some other versions. He could not wait to see you all. He was concerned for you when he found out you knew how sick he really was. He's about to die. This sickness was so severe, so intense, whatever it was, that he almost died from it. Was he at all worried about him almost dying? What was the only thing on his mind? I've got to get word back to my church people, back to the people that sent me, telling them I'm okay. Telling them not to worry about me. Telling them not to trouble themselves, to be anxious, to be concerned about me. Wow. If anybody had an opportunity to throw all the stuff, okay, I want some attention here. Hey, look at me. I almost died doing what you guys are supposed to be doing. You almost died doing this thing that you sent me to do here. Hey, I want some... I want some love. Show me some, show me some affection. Hey, if anybody could have done that, he would have had the right to do it. But he did not do it. So is he complaining? No. Is he doing those things that Paul was talking about? Sounds like it to me. Sounds like he's living those out. The WE version. I'm sending him back because he has been lonely without you all. His heart has been troubled because you heard he was sick. He's about to die, and yet he's lonely because he's away from his church family, and he's concerned that they're concerned that he's sick. Wow. Other versions say that he was distressed, full of heaviness, upset, worried, sad, grieved, and sorrowful. Think about that for a second. He's about to die. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, I know it, it's not uh, worth uh, discussing things that uh, aren't really necessarily uh, spelled out, if you will, you know, meaningless discussions and stuff. But I, I would venture to think because of human nature as it is, 
when somebody goes and go do something and then something happens, like for instance, a uh, missionary, they get sent out and then, you know, they catch COVID or they get arrested or, or whatever may happen to them, that now the church is too afraid to do the things that they, that they were called to do. And so his heart was to strengthen and encourage them to say, no, God will persevere. Right. And so, uh, yeah, I, I believe that you're absolutely right. Uh, for me, that's the type of picture that's being painted, uh, the core heart of God for people who do the Right. That's good. Yeah. And, and missionaries is probably the closest way that we have to think about it. But, but even the missionaries, and this may just be me. I, I grew up in a church that had all the missionaries that they supported like on the wall each month. I never really prayed for them. I never really thought about that. I never really, that was never really a thought on my mind, much less me hearing that they were sick and me getting worried about it. I wasn't that invested in them. Some of my money went to them. I'm, I'm not saying that I didn't invest that way, but to me, it says something even about the church family and how tight or knit that they were, that's something that I probably never even really experienced, uh, that I've never really been part of, that you would care so much that, first of all, that you knew that your missionary was sick. I mean, they didn't have communication back then. They didn't have uh, a way to do a FaceTime or a, a text message. Hey, I'm, I'm not feeling very well. Pray for me. How were they supposed to know? And yet they did. So this had gone on for a period of time, and they knew. Even with whatever communication systems they had back then, snail mail on steroids. I mean, big time snail mail. Even with that, they knew, and this thing had been long enough, that not only did word get back to them, but word came back from them to Epaphroditus that they were concerned about it. So this thing went on for a while. It wasn't a quick ordeal. And all the while, he's more motivated by their concern for him than he is for his own life. Wow. Was his own personal well-being the thing that was foremost on his mind? Not at all. His only concern was for his friends and family hearing that he was sick. This is the demonstration of what a man of God looks like. Here's a man of faith. Here's a man of love. Here's a man who ended up getting healed because he wasn't focusing on himself. He wasn't concerned necessarily with his own well-being, but was concerned about how his illness was affecting others, not just him. Faith can be undermined by selfishness. I'll say that again. Faith can be undermined by selfishness. Have you ever seen some people or heard of some people or talked to some people who use sickness for some sort of advantage in their life? As long as you use sickness, you'll keep your sickness. As long as it has a benefit to you, call it a benefit, I'll put that in quotes, You'll keep it. Kids find out that they don't have to go to school when they are sick, especially on test days. Sick kids get special attention and maybe their favorite food that they don't get otherwise. They get to watch their favorite shows. Sometimes people view sickness as a friend. They get their pillow fluffed, extra hugs and kisses that day. People cater to them. Hey, this isn't so bad. This sickness stuff is pretty cool. I like this. I like this attention. I like this concern. This can start a lifestyle of seeing sickness as something that you should expect, tolerate, and even use rather than resist. Fast forward to adults. You come across a nice day and the fish are biting. You call in sick because you'd rather be doing something else than go to work. In this case, sickness is your friend. It's your companion or your accomplice. You have just made an agreement with some sort of sickness and will remain connected to that sickness until that agreement gets broken. 
as a heat and air technician, uh, man, I can't tell you how many times I have heard in the last two and a half years, um, man, uh, I can't show up today for work because I tested positive for COVID. I'm like, man, I'm so sorry that, you know, you're feeling down, man. Hopefully you get feeling well or work, however I work at a particular time. I'm like, oh, no, I, I haven't felt it. Anything, anything. <laughs> I'm like, well, why did you go and get tested? Man? Right. But you see, like, right. like, I mean, if you're not feeling sick, why go get tested? But anyway, and it's, it just doesn't matter with what you're saying. Like, you know, people these days, they're so comfortable. You know how how long it hurts me I, when people have that twinkle in the eye to get acknowledgement because they're in a wheelchair or something. It's like, right. right. It's like, you gotta break down all these walls. You know, right. Before, you know, before you're ready to receive, before you're ready to. Has the right to yes. Yes. People use sickness as a way to get money. It's a way to be supported and not work. People use sickness to get out of things or certain responsibilities. I can't do that right now because I'm sick. Have you heard this stuff? Uh, hopefully we haven't said this stuff, but have you heard it? I would, but I'm sick right now. So I, I can't do it at this point. I want to, but I, I'm sick. I, I, can't, I can't do it. Lying and joining something that is a work of the enemy is never a good thing to do. You made an agreement with that thing by lying about it. You're making it, you're giving it power. You're giving it rulership. And do you see how that is self-absorbed? It's about you. It's not about somebody else. People try to use sickness to manipulate their spouses. It gives them a supposed excuse to be short with each other to be selfish, to be demanding. You try to act like a heathen and then say, I'm sorry, I'm just not feeling good today. Feeling bad is no excuse for being mean. What's in charge? What is ruling your life? Jesus should still be the Lord of your life whether you feel good or don't. And his opinion about how you should behave hasn't changed whether you feel good or don't. But yet somehow we think we have an excuse to deviate from what we know we're supposed to do behavior-wise just because I'm not feeling good. People of faith or love don't want you burdened with their problems. Think about that. If you're really operating in faith, you do not want somebody else to be concerned about you. If you're really operating in love, you don't want somebody else to be concerned about whatever it is you're going through. Carnal or selfish people are the only ones that do that. Those folks want you to know exactly how bad it is and how much it hurts. But you don't understand. And then I would reply, why do I need to understand? Is my understanding of how bad you hurt going to change anything? Is my understanding of how bad you feel going to make things any better? Going to do anything differently? At what point along this journey is any of this going to change? You've got to get a new attitude. You've got to do a new perspective. You've got to say something different than what you're saying right now before this ever has a shot of being any different than it currently is. Why do they want you to know how bad they feel? So you will agree with them that their situation is terrible that they have a right to be mean. Oh, this is just so unfortunate. Are you helping anything with that agreement? You might make them emotionally feel better for just a second, but are you really helping that situation at all? And then the better question is, if you're the person that's doing that, why? What benefit does it give you? Well, I feel better for three seconds. Yay, your situation is actually worse. You're no closer to faith. You're no closer to victory. You're no closer to healing. You're no closer to deliverance. In fact, you took a step the opposite direction. We're talking about how to get healed here. Here's a man who is deathly sick, 
and he was still only concerned himself with the fact that others were concerned about him. And this guy ended up getting healed. Is there a clue there for some of us? Is there a plan there for some of us? Many people can make this one change and begin to come out of their sickness. What one change? Instead of getting people to agree with how bad your situation is, Find somebody that's going to push you to speak faith about it, to speak healing, to speak deliverance. Make that one change, and a whole bunch of people are going to start coming out of their circumstance. What changed? Them. Is God's power any different before or after they started making that change? No. Is God's willingness to heal any more or different since that change? No. It's always been God's will to heal. It's always been God's desire to heal. It's always been God's uh, willingness to, to do it now, to start the process now, to finish the process. All he wants, all he's waiting on is your cooperation and not your opposition. This is it. I am done with sickness. I'm done using it as a tool. I don't want it or any of its benefits in my life any longer. No longer will I make excuses for myself or my behavior because of the sickness. No longer will I justify being self-centered because I'm sick. No one, one does not necessitate the other. What, what do I mean by that? One, me being sick does not necessitate me letting everybody else know that I'm not in a good mood. One does not automatically demand the other. I can live above this. I can be hurting. I can, in this case, I can almost be about to die and still choose to be more concerned about how my illness, my thing affects you than how it affects me. Sickness does not force you to be selfish, ill-tempered, demanding, or rude. You must make up your own mind that sickness is not your friend. It has no place in your life. I will not use it or any of its supposed advantages. I resist it and all of its benefits and all of its advantages. If you even want to call them, I resist it completely. That sickness is of the devil and I completely resist the devil and by association, he and it must flee. But what changed? We have to decide, I'm no longer going to be a friend to this. I'm no longer going to benefit from this sickness. I'm going to renounce any of the blessings, if you want to call them that, that come with me being sick and letting everybody else know that I'm sick. Some people get mad when you don't agree with them about the terribleness of their situation. You better find somebody who wants to talk about living and not dying. You need to talk, find somebody that wants to talk to you about being healed and being free and not about you dying, not about this sickness continuing. Someone who is more impressed with our rights in Christ than in the problem that you seem to be facing. Someone who has more faith in God to heal you than in the devil he does to keep you sick. You need to find some faith buddies. Some people that will force you to say the right things, to do the right things, who won't get into agreement with your self-pity. Who won't get down there in the ditch with you. Now, I'm not saying you, you from the top of the hill while they're in the hole, oh, you shouldn't have gotten down there. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying... It's a judgmental. I'm not saying that at all. Here, let me help you up. Well, I don't want to be up. I want you to fall down in the ditch with me. I want you to fall down in the hole with me. Then I'll have some company down here. No, I'm not joining you down in the hole. I will help you get out of the hole. But if you want me to get down in the hole with you, you're going to have to find somebody else. I'm not doing it. You see the difference between those two things. How many people are trapped because they simply will not make that adjustment, will not make that shift. How many people go on and on and on and on, time after time, week after week, never healed, never changed, simply because they're more concerned with getting other people to feel sorry for them than they are to find somebody that'll get an agreement with them to get them out of that mess. Don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. <laughs> when you find somebody, the conversation should not begin with you telling them in detail how much pain and how much issue you're having. If you're having a bad day, how should you start that conversation? Hey, come over here. Tell me how healed I am. Hey, 
I need to talk to you a minute. I need you to remind me of the healing power of God working in my body. That is a far different conversation than me giving you the details down to the gory, whatever, of, of all the different things that I'm struggling with, all the different things that I'm facing. Entirely different conversation. Is it okay for the person in the hole to say, okay, come over here and you tell me how healed I am. You tell me how delivered I am. You tell me how whole I am. We should gladly participate in that conversation. Much, much different than I want you down here in the hole with me. Me, right. And I'm not saying I'm, I don't feel compassion that you're going through some stuff, but I, I recognize nothing is going to change until your mouth and your heart are different about this deal. It doesn't matter how dirty I get in the hole with you, nothing is going to change until you make a change. So if you want to make a change, yes, here, here's my hand. I will help you up out of that hole. But if all you're going to do is sit there and gripe and complain, bye. You know, and, and the, the world has everything convinced that when people talk like that, they have to say it softly that they're not compassionate. Right. You know, and they just they it's just so hard sometimes to talk to even people inside the church about confronting them and things that are similar to what you're describing right there uh, because everyone thinks oh you know as long as you have a smile on your face and you're accepting and you're a compassionate and you mourn when I mourn and you cry when I cry and you know that is that's the, the right way to act that's Christianity that's the way that's what Jesus would do and it's not right it's not God did God did not uh move Jesus uh, to tell a guy who's paralyzed for 38 years to to empathize with him or sympathize with him. He said, Are you, do you want to be healed? Right. He spoke directly to him. Do you want to be healed? Well, pick up your mat and walk. Right. And, and, and that was an obvious question, too. I mean, that was the reason he was at the pool is, why else would I be here if I didn't want to be healed? You got to change your thoughts. You got to change your mind. I know that's why you're here, but do you really want all the things that come with you being healed? Are you willing to denounce all the benefits that come from <laughs> that come from your sin? I get. Okay, uh, let's go back to Epaphroditus, chapter two, twenty-five to twenty-seven from the message. But for right now, I'm dispatching Epaphroditus, my good friend and companion in my work. You sent him to help me out. Now I'm sending him to help you out. Now, isn't that interesting? You, as a church, sent him to deliver the care package, to deliver the offering, to help me. Now I'm sending him back to you to help you. Now, don't you think that Paul would have enjoyed keeping him around? Was it encouraging, probably, for Paul, especially after he got healed, to hang out with Epaphroditus and to hear stories of all the people? No, I, I can't do I can't allow myself to enjoy this time any more than is necessary because it's most important that he come back to you. He has been wanting in the worst way to get back with you, especially since recovering from the illness you heard about. He's been wanting to get back and reassure you that he is just fine. He nearly died, as you know, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, he had mercy on me too. His death would have been one huge grief piled on top of all the others. I'm going to remove the first part of that passage and get the end on a single slide here. So we're going to read this again, but I'm going to take part of it out. He's been wanting in the worst way to get back with you, especially since recovering from the illness you heard about. He's been wanting to get back and reassure you that he's fine. He nearly died, as you know, but God had mercy on him. He's not only for him, had mercy on me too. His death would have been one huge grief piled up on top of all the others. Now, exactly how did this healing take place? It says he was so sick that he almost died. And then he recovered from the sickness and eventually went back to Philippi. I would call that a healing, right? So sick he almost died, and then now he's well enough to go back to the place that he came from. I would call that a healing. How does the Bible describe what happened between those two extremes? God had mercy on him. So the entire act of healing 
in this passage is covered by God had mercy on him. Is mercy a healing? Yes. All right, let me phrase that a different way. Is healing a mercy? Yes. So within the definition of mercy, whatever you want to define that is, you're going to find existing within the concept of mercy, healing. I mean that again, and this is in between the lines kind of statement, like what I said earlier. I believe because the desire of E. Brady's E. Brady, Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. Epi. Uh, my pronunciation is my worst thing at this moment. Uh, however, um, I believe because God seeing that his will can be used in them, it was more beneficial to, to for that healing and manifest for the benefit of others uh, as opposed to, you know. In this case, and that's what the text is talking about, that, that it was better for the group at Philippi that he get well and go back to them to, to help them. It was better for Paul, that Paul wouldn't have to deal with the grief of the Philippian church in addition to all the other stuff going on healing is a mercy healing is a component of mercy healing is just one form of mercy there are a lot of verses in the bible that talk about his mercies plural more than one are new every morning well what are those mercies well healing is part of that there's some other parts to mercy but in the general confines of mercy you will find in some cases healing okay what is mercy all right, let me ask it this way. What is the opposite of mercy? Judgment. judgment. So on one hand, you've got mercy. On the other hand, you've got judgment. What's the difference between the two? Holding back consequences versus Okay. Mercy, you do not get what you deserved. Right? Judgment, you do get what you deserved. So if God gives you mercy, thank God, he did not give us what He we deserve to receive. If God dealt with him in the aspect of judgment, he would receive what he deserved to receive. So the opposite of mercy is judgment. Keep that in mind. You don't need mercy when you've done everything right. If you hadn't made any mistakes, you can rely on justice, on judgment, not on mercy. Mercy is only required when you've messed up something. And you do not want to reap the full benefit, the full reward of whatever it is that you have done or haven't done. Are we good? Are we clear? If you don't want to reap what you've sown, then you do not want justice. You want mercy. Many of the healings that we've talked about involve the person requesting mercy. Between a third and a half of the ones that we've talked about, the person asks for mercy. And ended up walking away healed. You can look up some of these. Matthew 9, 27, the two blind men. Matthew 15, 22, the Canaanite woman's daughter. Matthew 17, 15, the father with the demon-possessed son. Matthew 20, 30, two blind men. Uh, Mark 1, 40, the leper. Mark 10, 47, also Luke 18, 38, the blind man. So if you are of the conviction that says healing is not for everybody today, and healing is a mercy. What did you just say? That mercy's not for everyone today. We know that's not true. But somehow we don't think of healing being a mercy. So it's we, we're free to talk about healing in a different way than we talk about mercy. It is a mercy. So if mercy is still around and God is freely extending mercy, then God is also freely extending healing. Does that make sense? And in this text, God had mercy on him. In other words, you could say in a different translation, if you want to say it, God healed him because he had mercy on him. Okay, now why did he need mercy and not judgment? Let's keep going. Uh, read this passage and then we'll go back to... Uh, uh, Epaphroditus, Psalm 86, 5. For you, O Lord, are good and ready to forgive our trespasses, sending them away, letting them go completely and forever. You are abundant in mercy and loving kindness to all who call upon you. So if he's abundant in mercy to all who call upon him, 
then he's also abundant in healing to all who call upon him, right? Okay, what did Epaphroditus do that required mercy and not judgment? Verse 30, he placed his life in grave danger for the work of the anointed. He risked his life to serve me when you couldn't. Other versions of this say, without regard for his life, he hazarded his life, venturing his life, delivering his life, put his life on the line, recklessly exposed himself. Now, what's all that saying? Remember, what was he doing? Why was Epaphroditus even there? He was bringing the offering from Philippi to Rome. So that was his task. That was his assignment. The church voted or decided or whatever. Hey, Epaphroditus is the guy. He's going to take our offering to Paul. So his task was to take the offering to Paul. He was sick because of something that happened on that journey of him bringing the offering to Paul. What could that have been? Now, I want you to recall that travel in those days is nothing like it was today. It was about 700 miles from Philippi to Rome. Most of that would have probably been done on foot. At that time, between 15 and 20 miles a day would be a walking rate for people to walk. So let's go on the low end since there was nothing to indicate that he was particularly fit or trained to do walking. So let's say 15 miles a day. 1,500 miles a day, 700 miles would take 47 days. So this guy is walking eight hours a day for 47 days. That's not taking into account the Sabbath. Correct. That's if he walked it straight through. So this is a serious journey. This isn't, we're driving to Dallas today. This there, There's something going on here with a 47-day journey for him to get this offering to Paul. What could have happened during those 47 days? First of all, if he did it consecutive, how would you like to run half or walk half of a marathon each day for 47 days? Even if you had trained for it, how exhausted would you be when you got there? How exhausted would you be if you were burned or something? Uh, exactly. And, and that's another part of this. Uh, maybe he was out in the cold too long. Maybe he was out in the heat too long. Maybe he, he got dehydrated. Maybe a combination of the above. Maybe he pushed himself to the point of exhaustion or dehydration. Maybe he ran into would-be robbers and he fought them off instead of letting them have this offering that he was responsible for getting to Paul. Maybe some people caught him who didn't like Paul and wasn't real thrilled about letting this offering pass to Paul. So they beat the pudding out of Epaphroditus. But he fought them off. He held on to that offering. He was able to, to get the offering, or at least part of it, to where it was going. Was any of this along the journey God's perfect will or God's wisdom? The church decided. The church God decided to make it good. And I'm not saying that they were wrong about their appointment. I'm not saying that at all. But along this journey, is there any indication that he absolutely followed the wisdom of God about where to go, when to go, how to go, who he needed to talk to. Yeah. Right, right. So I submit to you that while he's taking this 47-day trip, something happened along that journey that was not God's direction. Correct. Whatever. Now he did his job. He got at least part of the offering to Paul. And Paul says, thank you for the gift. Now I'm abundantly supplied. Everything's taken care of now. That you got that gift to me. Awesome. Thank you very much. So he did his job. Was he always in wisdom? I'm going to say that he wasn't. Otherwise, he wouldn't have needed mercy. And he could have got by on justice. So he did something that he knew he shouldn't have done as he's trying to get from point A to point B. We know, we, we, we know that God's absolute divine uh, blessing wasn't upon him to have complete safe passage or he went out of that city. Right. 
or he disobeyed at some point along the journey. Yeah. He he should have given him the offering and come back and got a different offering. He, he should have gone a different way, a different time. I don't know. I don't know what happened. The Bible doesn't elaborate any, but he exposed himself recklessly. He did something that was not in wisdom with regard to his human body, with regard to traveling conditions, with regard to safety. He did something that ended up resulting in him getting sick and almost sick enough to die. And because he did something or didn't do something, his healing required mercy, judgment that he did not receive instead of, if he had done all the steps right, he could have said, God, you owe me. I'm doing this for you. I did exactly what you wanted me to do. You owe me healing. Now, how many of you realize, even when I say that, that that's a scary thing to say? Right. How immature do you be for you to say, God, you owe me this. You owe me that. And what that means is everything you've done between point A and point B is exactly what God told you to do. Is exactly the will of God. You 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 never deviated. Oh, this is my body, and I'm, I'm overweight, and and all this stuff is going wrong with my body, and, and I'm just going to have to be happy with my body because this is the body that God gave me. Really. So what you're saying there is everything you ate for the last thirty years was exactly what God wanted you to eat, and all the exercise that you did or didn't do was exactly what God wanted you to do for that thirty years. Are you sure you want to say that? So it's dangerous for any of us to say, God, you owe me this because I've done everything right. It's a much better thing to say, God, have mercy on me. I've tried to do it. I've tried to obey you. I've tried to follow you, but I'm certain that I have messed it up at several points along the way. So rather than me asking for the just resort, just desserts of my efforts, I'm going to ask for mercy instead, just in case. And as one of those mercies, I would love to be healed because of what I am trying to do here, because of what I did, because of my efforts. The other churches that Epaphroditus might have come in contact with all along this journey, Paul also founded them. Would they be inclined to help him? It's said in chapter four, you, the Philippian church, are the only church that contributed to me. So here he is in route carrying the offering from Philippi to Paul, and he stops in, I don't know, um, Ephesus. I don't, I don't know if it's Ephesus is along the way or not. He stops in Ephesus. Hey, I'm going to go see Paul. Would you guys take me up for the night? What are you doing? Well, I'm taking an offering to him. Uh, no, I don't think we want any part of that. Why? It made him look bad. They hadn't given him an offering. They hadn't done anything that they were supposed to do to support Paul's ministry. So he had enemies and he had friends, if you want to call them that, who didn't want anything to do with him getting that offering to Paul. And in the process of doing this, he did some things that were beyond normal human activity, exposed himself in some way. He, he got himself in trouble in some way, so much so that it required God's mercy rather than God's justice to get him healed. If it wasn't for the mercy of God, Epaphroditus would have died. Not it wasn't for the justice of God. If it wasn't for the mercy of God, Epaphroditus would have died. So he did something. And he acknowledged in some way that he did something that he probably wasn't wisdom. It probably wasn't good for him that got me into this mess, that got me deathly sick, and now God's going to have to have mercy on me to get me out of this. Remember, you don't need mercy when you've done everything right. You only need mercy when you messed up at some point along the way. Thank God for mercy. We need to start praying for mercy a whole lot more. And interestingly enough, every person that came, well, in general, every person that came to Jesus anyway was healed. But every person that asked him for mercy walked away healed. So one of our prayers for healing needs to be, God, have mercy. Have mercy on me when I have done things that I shouldn't have done, when I've done things that, that weren't wisdom, when I've done things that you directed me not to do. God, have mercy. 
help me to do better, help me to, to change, help me to, to be more like you, to be more obedient. But in the meantime, I'm in a mess and I know I got myself here. Have mercy on me. Thoughts from today for healing uh, with regard to Epaphroditus. Number one, don't be selfish. Don't be selfish. If your healing was just about you, God would still do it. But your healing is never just about you. Who else are you going to get to bless when you got healed? And the answer is going to be no one if all you're concerned about was your stuff before you got healed. Your greatest concern should be about others and not yourself. Number two, don't use sickness as a crutch, tool, or friend. Don't use sickness as a crutch, tool, or a friend. You must be completely done with sickness and break all of its ties to it before you can be free from it. I know of people who will not pray to be healed from whatever disease because they receive a check from the government for that disease each month. They receive a, a disability check. They receive some sort of check. Well, as long as that tie still exists, you have no grounds. Well, what does that mean? Well, after God heals you, he can fix the other part of it too. But you've got to make a choice. You've got to say, even if I never get anything from that, even if I never get that challenge resolved, I break it, loyalty, I break the bonds with the sickness, I expect God to heal me, and then we'll work on that other problem. Fear, Fear right. Three, you are still human. You are still human. You must take care of yourself. You can't just say, I'm doing this for the Lord and ignore natural laws like rest, nutrition, exposure to elements, exhaustion, dehydration, etc. Now, for a period of time, God can give you grace. God can give you a supernatural ability to just get it done. But you've got to know at the end of it, that's not sustainable. That's a, that's a one-time shot in the arm, so to speak. That can't be the way you live your life. You need to make some adjustments. You need to incorporate some rest. You need to incorporate some other things into your life so that you're not always having to make a demand on God's special grace to get you through something, to get you past something. What you're doing is you're keeping your body in a weakened condition so your immune system is not capable to fight off any of the natural stuff that is so prevalent and so commonplace. Number four, no one ever deserves healing. No one ever deserves healing. If you're really honest about it, all that any of us actually deserve is to be broke, sick, depressed, die early, go to hell, directly to hell, do not pass go, do not collect $200. That's all any of us really deserve. When we get through with all the religious junk about it and all the, all the lies we've told ourselves, that's all any of us deserve. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for mercy. And I'll take mercy over judgment any time, any day of the week. Because I know if it was all just based on judgment, I'm done. It is over for me. Number five, ask God for mercy. Ask God for mercy. God is always ready to extend mercy in whatever form it is needed, including healing to those who ask for it. Epaphroditus, he did all those things. He wasn't selfish. He didn't use sickness as a crutch. He didn't even think about his own sickness. He was more concerned about what the people thought about his sickness. He finally realized, okay, I'm still human and I probably didn't do this right. I, I probably didn't get from here to there in exactly the right method. I got here, thank God I got here, but I almost died in the process and there's something wrong with the way this went about. But even in the midst of me bringing the gift from Philippi to Paul, I still don't deserve healing. I was doing a good thing. They sent me to do it, and I finished the job. But even in the midst of all that, I still do not deserve to be healed. 
because I blew it, because I messed up. So I'm going to ask God for mercy. And God extended mercy, not only to him in his healing, but to Paul, because now he doesn't have to deal with the loss of his friend and the grief of the church that missed him so dearly. A little more in the story of Epaphroditus than what many of us realized before. 